Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back. I warned you I'm going to be psychoanalyzed. All right. So uh, welcome, Dr. Geo. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Glad to be here. Hi. Once again, good to see you. You know, for those of you that don't know, um, this is the second time. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, I guess for you and I, we're going to have a little game time. So, so thanks for making it. And, and uh, I was going to give you the, the opening volley on how you wanted this to go. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah, I'll listen. You know, one of the things I find myself saying more and more as I engage with professional investors, just like I did with PGA Tour golfers, is, you know, it's an adults-only kind of table. <laughs> uh, it's the big leagues. And, and, um, and one of the things you come to find, really in all, we call achievement domains. An achievement domain in psychology is defined as anything with a measurable score, right? And sports, hedge fund world, P&L, scoreboard, right? And at the tail end of that curve, there are certain things that are really common. Independent of the domain, uh, you know what good looks like. And, and I say all that um, because, and, and I articulated this to people in the last week on my way up here, Serious people take hedge eye seriously, very literally. Like, like that's, that's a tell. When, when people I work with, we're very serious people, take uh, you seriously. Now, why do they take you seriously? Well, you tell the truth. I come in, I see how hard your people work. Every morning I look, it's 5 a.m., and you're saying top of the risk management, like the work ethic, the transparency, the, the fact that you, you know, th there's no hiding. Like you, all the things that you do, and that you are doing here are all the telltale signs of the tail end of the curve. When I went to the Buffalo Bills uh, and I first met Sean McDermott. Now look what Sean McDermott has done to the Buffalo Bills. 17 years they didn't make the playoffs. Made it you know, every year since then. Well, how does that happen? Well, look at the profile. He gets up early, 5 a.m. At 5 a.m., Sean McDermott's up. You're up at 5, 5.30. Process, discipline, rigor. So uh, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'll say one other thing. When, uh, when Peter Buck, the guitarist of R.E.M., uh, used to use a, a guitar called the Rickenbacker, and Rickenbacker wanted to sponsor him. He said, no, no, you don't need to sponsor me. I'll, I'll say it for free. Rickenbacker's a great guitar. Uh, and that's how I feel about you and about what you're doing at Hedgeye. I think you're important to the world, and I think you're important to market participants. And oh. that is, I'm get, I get nothing for that. Wow. So keep, <laughs> I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. I, yeah. And here I, I'm getting ready to get a uh, psychoanalyze, and you're giving me these. I mean, it's 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 so cool to get a compliment like that, and it's um, it's a compliment to my team too. I mean, our our team. This doesn't happen unless you have teammates that buy in. You know, if that daily process isn't executed on. I was going to start with that actually asking you a question because you know I've been citing. I generally cite the book that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. um, lately, I found some inspiration in. You know different types of sports that I you know uh, I played football and Canadian football is not not really football, however, relatively speaking. Yeah. But this guy's process, man, like it was in a way like speaking to me in a way that it was okay. What was it? So so I know you know I, I studied college football. I worked with the Florida Gators during the Urban Meyer Tim Tebow era. Yeah. Uh, had a front row seat to the Steve Spurrier era because I was a student at the University of Florida, and I obviously paid close attention to SEC football. I know Nick Saban's mind to a degree. What is it about that book that spoke to you? The discipline of his process. Unbelievable. Right down to, I think it's a little weird that I eat the exact same thing at the exact same time for breakfast every single day. Mm -hmm. I learned that in that book. You know, I mean, same time he eats lunch. Like, it's more the, it's the, it's the, deliberate nature of executing on it mm -hmm. and having no real room to change that. I, I, it took me a long time to be okay, like just being me in that regard. Yeah. And it's really hard to do when you're built building a company. Yeah. But what, now that you have teammates that can support you, I can play the game like I would like when I was running money. Yeah. If I was sitting there working at where, wherever, um, now I'm doing that. And I could, I could see that in, in, in his pace. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, yeah. No, so, so let's talk about that because, you know, we talk about process all the time. You hear it in the markets all the time. Every, every hedge fund, whether it's Citadel and Schoenfeld and Point72 and Eisler Capital, in the interview, everyone, oh, what's your process? And they talk about it in sports all the time. Yeah. Right? In a quarterback position in particular in the NFL, PGA Tour. It begs the question, and, and I often ask this to people, and it's not a trick question, but, but everyone is repeating it, 
And I'm not sure a lot of people understand why process matters. So you are a student of the game, and you're religious about process. You tweet about it all the time. What's the value? I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. What's the value of process to a market participant? What's the value of process? The first thing is it reduces your um, error rate, reduces the failure rate, and it ups the probability of success. So that's the main reason to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, value of process, too, is that it helps readily identify something that's changed. Mm -hmm. you know, so that's like a big part of it. If you just keep doing the same thing, writing it down every single day, once something changes, you are forced to notice today that the Japanese yen is bullish against, or is now bearish against the dollar. Right. Um, and, and then finally, I just think it's just a good way to live. I mean, I, I, I love it. Yeah. I would, I'm not happy when I'm not doing it that way. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you think of the word discipline, the root word of discipline is disciple, right? Built into discipline is disciple. What's a disciple? A disciple is a student, right? The translation of disciple is, is a student. You know, Jesus' disciples were students. We talk about self-discipline. Well, what is self-discipline? Well, self-discipline, literally uh, translated, is to, is to be a student of oneself, right? So, so if, if you sort of understand the value of discipline, um, the origins of it, why it matters in a job like this. So, so the way psychology views this, one of, the, one of the perspectives of psychology, and the reason that process matters and routines matter um, to market participants, and the reason that every major company is always asking uh, market participants about the process, here's, here's the psychological view on it, right? So if you understand the design of the brain, uh, the brain is constantly reacting to the environment around it, right? Situated cognition. It's most obvious if someone walks into a casino, right? You go into a casino and there's no clocks on the walls and there's no windows and they pump it full of oxygen. Why is that? Because what is known is that if you can control the environment around an individual with probability, you can shape their behavior, which is why what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? I, I know that if you walk into a casino and it's full of oxygen, well, that's going to elevate you know, your, your autonomic nervous system. And there's no window, so you don't know what time it is. And there's no clocks, and you don't know what time it is. All of a sudden, they know that by controlling the environment, they're going to shape your behavior and likely going to take your money, right? And then you're going to walk out, and the sun's coming. Like, what happened, right? <laughs> so what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Now, why is that? So the brain is always attaching to the environment around the individual. On the PGA Tour, the way this shows up is, is this. I'm a golfer. And, and the variables, right, the variability around a golfer, there's the score. I, I feel really different if I'm three under on the 10th hole as opposed to if I'm three over, right? But my psychology is really different. Um, if I'm paired with Tiger Woods, it's really different than being paired with Matt Kucha, right? And all of a sudden, the, the people, there's variability in the player. There's variability in your score. There's variability in the scoreboard itself, right? Am I 10 under, am I 10 over, and so forth. Now, what happens as a, at an unconscious level is when golfers start attaching to variability, they start becoming reactive to things over which they have no control, right? So that's the, the, the psychological setup is there's an individual and the environment around the individual. And when that environment has variability around it, all of a sudden at an unconscious level, we change, right? That's the PGA Tour. That's casinos. That's the markets, mm. right? So think of an investor without a process. I'm an investor and I have no process. I'm showing up and I think I'm smarter than everybody else. And I've got a book on and I'm staring at my P&L. And all of a sudden, I'm making money, right? And, and so you start feeling good about yourself. Then you're losing money. You feel bad about yourself. And you start chasing, uh, you start chasing money or you're cutting. And all of a sudden, you're reactive to all these variables. And so the value of process is, is mathematically, it's constants and variables. And, and what process does, discipline in process, you know, what, when people say it's real, being religious about process, is it protects you from the variability um, surrounding the individual, particularly in P&L. And some of the best investors I know, and the more, the more senior they get, the more veteran they get, the more they detach from short-term P&L, mm -hmm. particularly when there's so many drivers of P&L these days. So I love that you preach process. I think every investor should have it, but I think it's really important that investors understand why they have a process, because you want to construct your process with intent, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that you're not reacting to things over which you have no control. Mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting, though. Like now, now most people are going to say that they need or want to have a process. If you don't have a world-class work ethic, you cannot execute on what I, what I define as a process doesn't exist just because you're smart. Yeah. 
doesn't exist just because you have P and L in years past. In the work ethic component, that's where I, um, even from the first time I was interviewed on Wall Street, I was like, well, you work hard, what does that mean? And this guy from Lehman, yeah, I tell the story a lot, uh, that was interviewing me, I said, well, well, let's take all these, you know, just get the athletes that have been working out all summer and put, let's lock them all in this room, throw a ball in here and see who comes out of it yeah. you know, with the ball. Yeah. Because you know, I want to see, like, who's determined and, and is mentally and physically prepared for this. That's right. Because <laughs> I just want, I don't know how else to say, like, you should have your own definition of your work ethic. And it can't be somebody else's. That's right. You know, it, it, it's a really interesting point because, uh, again, if you study the tail end of the curve, and this is domain agnostic, you know, the best of the best, it looks the same in the NFL and the NBA and Wall Street and the PGA Tour. You know, the conversations you have, you know, mediocrity or, you know, looks the same everywhere. Yeah. You know, average looks the same. There are telltales, and, and we talk about work ethics. So one of the interesting things, there's this really wonderful article and it's available online. It's called The Mundanity of Excellence. So if anyone's interested in reading an interesting little article, The Mundanity of Excellence. And it's a profile of world-class swimmers uh, from a coach who's coached world-class swimmers. And, and, and think of the title, The Mundanity of Excellence, right? <laughs> and one of the things that he says happens to, 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 as you're moving out on the tail end from, from being in the middle part of the distribution, getting better at something and better and better and better, and when you finally get to the tail end of the curve, he calls it an inversion. And he describes this inversion as young swimmers love to practice swimming. Elite swimmers spend a lot of time practicing the mundane things, the flip turn, the start, right, the, 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 the mm -hmm. launch into the water. Exceptionally good, you know, average golfers like to hit driver. Great golfers work on three-footers. Uh, Tiger Woods, I th I, I'm going to get the exact numbers wrong, but Tiger Woods went three years. I think he hit something in the range of 2,000 putts inside of three feet, and he missed two of them. And, you, and, and, and when you realize uh, and there were times where you go out to Isleworth Country Club, and after Tiger was done practicing, you look at the green, and where he stood and the, pe uh, the putts he practiced, the grass was burnt out. He would just just wear out three footers, and the idea being to be the, the work ethic you're talking about is to get obsessed with the fundamentals of what you're doing. That it doesn't need to be the sexy things or the flashy things; it's the fundamentals. Mm. And the other thing that happens at the tail end of the curve is we, we talk about this blending of vocation and avocation. You talk you, you mentioned it to me a little bit before we started chatting. One of the most fundamental questions that is not asked enough is why do you do what you do? And when you start to explore that question um, uh, for market participants, for doctors, for teachers, if, if, if there's not at a fundamental level a love of craft driven by curiosity and a passion to understand, in other words, you can't get into the markets just because you want to make a lot of money. It's too punishing of a, jo of a job. You've seen it. It'll run you out of the game. Mm -hmm. You can't get into medicine just because you want to make a lot. You'll end up you know, quitting medicine being a school teacher. You have to love everything about what you're doing to get to the tail end of the curve. So what happens is there's a blending of vocation and avocation, right? right? That, that, that who you are and what you do merge. Now what, you know, you know we talk about you know, what's normal. The psychology of the average will tell you, oh, you're not what you do. Who you are and what you do. Tell that to Kobe, you know, as he writes an ode to why I love basketball. Tell that to Jordan. Tell that to, to Tiger. Tell that to, uh, you know, to, to Steve Cohen. Steve Cohen hasn't needed money in 40 years. And the guy shows up. Over the course of 10,000 trading days, he missed four of them. Right? Four days he missed out of 10,000. <laughs> and it ain't for the money. Right? And so when you have a calling, in the literal term of the word calling, in the original term, the craft calls to you and you immerse yourself in it. So the work ethic you're describing can't just be about suffering. It has to be about you know, a story about uh, Plato's, uh, Plato's Academy. Uh, uh, and, and, and as the story goes, Socrates was teaching philosophy and said, hey, listen, you want to be a philosopher? Young man, come here. And he takes the kid's head and he holds it under a, under, under a bucket of water, which you can't do anymore. And, and when the kid, he pulls the kid's head out and he says, when you want oxygen, I mean, when you want truth, as badly as you just wanted that breath, you can sit at this academy. Until then, you're a tourist. <laughs> a tourist. Right? And so that desire that, yeah. that you want truth, you want to understand markets, you want to learn the game of golf, you want to live at the tail end of the curve. When you want it as badly as you want that next breath of oxygen, that's what we mean by it's an adults-only table. Until then, you're a tourist. 
Love that. The, um, so how do you take both your process and work ethic and then you see if all the best practices, ostensibly everyone's learning at a faster rate? You know, what do you mean by that? I, mean, I have access to this guy wrote this book faster than it could have been written. You know, he's the guy who reported on Alabama okay. for the whole time. Sure, yeah. You know, so now I'm up to speed on that. I'm up to speed on this. I'm up to, I get up to speed faster just through technology, people producing their thoughts. You know, there's thoughts everywhere. People will give them. It doesn't mean sure, that yeah. you should pay attention. Um, but when I was, when we were trying to recall what it's called, I think it's called Full Swing on mm -hmm. Netflix. Netflix, yeah, the golf, where, the golf documentary. So, so yeah. taking this back to golf, I'm watching this guy, Fitzpatrick, in one of the episodes. Yeah. And I'm like, why, why do they have, he's so kind of boring. He's like, you know, the other ones are better. They got like, you know, Paulina Gretzky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like this. And, and then I figured it out. I'm like, they must think that this guy's going to start winning some tournaments. This is before he won. Yeah. You know, and then he, I'm watching him win uh, Sunday against who everybody wanted to Jordan win. Jordan Spieth, yeah. He's yeah. in playoff against Jordan Spieth, yeah. But the way I just kept recalling while he was playing that playoff against Spieth, like how unbelievably deliberate this guy was and how committed he was, like in the, in the full swing episode, right down to when he sat down uh, to eat his dinner meal, he had this, this regime of nutrition ready, bang, 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 out the door. This guy was like a, I wouldn't call it a robot. I'd call it one determined motherfucker. Like yeah, this guy, he's unbelievable. <laughs> like he is going to beat you. Yeah. And, 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 and I didn't, I, I could see that, but then I finally saw the product of that, the outcome of that. Yeah. So one of the great quotes, uh, in my opinion, uh, in, in the last 20 years in golf is Tiger Woods when, when he was trying to explain to people how he does what he does. Like, because you know, it was, there was a lot of questions out here. Tiger Woods. And, and, and I'll tell a quick story because I know I've been uh, talkative too much. But I'll tell two quick stories about Tiger and I'll talk about Ma Matthew Fitzpatrick and I'll bring it around to, uh, to your worldview. Uh, Firestone Country Club. This is, this is so important for investors to hear. This is really important, I think. Par five at Firestone Country Club. Tiger hits driver. I think he hits five wood up near the green. And he takes a 60-degree uh, wedge out and, and, and he swings it. And the ball doesn't move. The club goes under the golf ball, and the golf ball doesn't move. So then he takes the same club. He hits his fourth shot. It rolls out about 15 feet past the hole, and he makes the putt for par, right? So he makes par on a par five. Here's how he decided afterwards in the media. Tiger, what happened on that hole? Tiger says, well, good drive, good second shot. He goes, I couldn't tell how much grass was under the golf ball. He said, I executed the shot exactly as I wanted to. But there's no way to know how much grass was under the ball. He says, so the ball didn't move. He says, my fourth shot, I had picked a spot on the green, and I hit the ball exactly where I was aiming. It was a perfect shot, and the ball caught a ridge, and it ran out 15 feet. He says, and then I hit a bad putt that went in. To the viewer, the, the shot that the ball didn't move was a bad shot, and the second shot ended up, or, or fourth shot, bad shot, and the putt was good to the viewer. To Tiger, it's the exact opposite. What Tiger is saying is this. Great process, bad result. Great process, bad result. Bad process, and the ball went in. Yeah. And that's how he lived in the game of golf, which is why. One of the great quotes in the history of the game, in my opinion, when, 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 when he was detailing, he said, there are no hard shots, and there are no easy shots. There are only shots. So what Tiger did is he treated every shot the same. Yeah. Final round at a major, Thursday at the moment, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. Matthew Fitz Fitzpatrick, who beat Jordan Spieth in the playoffs. Yeah, a remarkable nine. And Matthew, what were you thinking? He goes, it's just another nine iron. And therein lies the lesson you for did. the market participants. Treat your process. Don't get caught up in P&L swings and yeah. short-term moves. There are no hard shots. There are no easy shots. There's only shots. That's an excellent point because he won his. He's won two tournaments, and in the prior tournament, he won it with a nine iron. Yeah, yeah. And he, um, it was, it was, it was interesting because Spieth gave him the opportunity twice by missing two putts. Mm -hmm. And who are, I think it was Jim Nance. He said, "Look, you know, you give this guy opportunities. Yeah, he's going to beat you. That's right. But he didn't force the opportunity. He waited for his opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he didn't." sit there and tell Speed to miss a putt. He, and I think for me in markets, that's ex the exact same way. Like I have a go anywhere strategy, so I could wait weeks. I don't wait weeks because I trade a lot of things, but I will wait 
for the low end of the range to execute. I will wait for the top end of the range to mm -hmm. execute yeah. because I know that that's where I'm going to swing that at, 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 at that. So, to so, me, I've tried to boil it down to that kind of a discipline where, back to the first part of the answer and why is your process so important, because yeah. I want to reduce my error rate to mm -hmm. the lowest level so mm -hmm. I can have the highest success rate. So let me ask you this, because one of the things we talk about in golf is waiting is a skill. When we talk about skill as something that's developable, right? You, you, traits, you can't change. Personality, you're not going to change. But a skill is something you can actually improve at, right? Yeah. And so waiting as a skill is different than patience. Patience is an aggregate way of being. Waiting for opportunity. See, see, waiting is not a passive thing in golf. Like waiting for your opportunity. You're actively engaged and you're working just as hard, but you're waiting for that moment. What's the difference for a market participant who's doing a great job at waiting versus someone who's just, let me, let me ask it differently because I don't, I don't want to leave the question. When you're waiting for that opportunity, it looks like nothing's happening. <laughs> what is actually happening in your psychological life? Like when you're waiting for that opportunity, what does it look like? In the market? No, in, in, for you, in your mind. What are you doing internally? You're not trading, you're not forcing it, but what are you doing? I'm just processing, just watching. Just watch, waiting and watching. I, I, I actually write that in my coaching notes a lot. I'm waiting and watching, waiting and watching. And it's interesting that you say there's a difference between waiting and patience. I always say, you know, maybe it's because there's alliteration waiting and watching, but I say patience should be core to your process. Yeah. Um, but I'm just, that's what I'm doing. All right. so, so there's this wonderful book called Finding Flow. You've probably read it. Uh, so we talk about flow states as being the highest functioning of the mind, like human beings in the zone. Athletes call it being in the zone. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and when we're in the market participants, I'm seeing the ball, right? And so people can get into the zone gardening and cooking and, and conversing. There's so many. If you're doing yeah. what you love to do, there's, there's the highest level of functioning of the human, uh, of the human being. So human functioning at its highest. One of the things we know about flow states is the, the defining feature of flow, in fact, is that it's not a passive process. So you can get into flow watching TV, but there's two types of watching TV. There's the passive, oh, I'm just receiving information, you're checked out. Uh, <laughs> but there's the active watching, and you're, you're internally, mm -hmm. who's the actor? What's his story? What's her story? What's the plot? What's the narrative? Who wrote it? So the active engagement of any particular thing is what leads to flow, mm -hmm. which is why love of craft leads to flow. People generally fall into flow when they're doing the thing that they love. Time slows down. They see things more. There's a paradox, a paradox of time. Like it, time slows down, but in retrospect, it went by very quickly, right? It feels effortless, which is why market participants say, yeah, when you're making money, it feels like you never lose money again. Like it's effortless because the, the high level of engagement. Um, and so when we talk about uh, the parallel in golf and, and market participants, you have to love markets to be great at this. You have to love challenge. And so the Russian psychologist Lev Vygotsky talks about what he calls the zone of proximal development. The, the best equivalent I can think of is snow skiing. You know, if you're, if you're on the bunny slope, it gets boring, so you go to the greens. <laughs> well, you master the greens, you gotta go to the blues. Blues, blacks. And so this escalating level of challenge, because what expands consciousness and, and cognitive ability is if you challenge yourself just beyond the level of your current capabilities. And one of the things that I've watched you do over time and I know a bit about your story just because my clients who respect you have told me about your background. It's what Steve Cohen says, who I am enamored with. You know, Steve, I've worked with for years, and, and as a human being, I'll stand by it. It's just an unbelievable human being, um, you know, an expression of, of excellence. I'm so proud of him as, as a human being and as a man. But what he always says is play a bigger game. Like, whatever game you're playing, play a bigger game. And that's a simple euphemism. But it's psychologically sound because you don't ever want to get stale in life. I mean, you walk around with dead eyes. When Freud said that eyes, the eyes are the window to the soul, you go through this life and you walk around and you watch people's eyes. You know, the eyes are not, see, see, people don't understand, the eyes are not connected to the brain. The eyes are the brain. The brain ran, ran out of room to grow. The eyes grew out. Your eyes are your brain. Like, like the neuroscientists and neurologists, it's unequivocal and inarguable. And so when you look at people's eyes and you watch people walk around with dead eyes versus watching people walk around with lively eyes. Mm. And that's what I see in you, and that's why I'm here. That's what I see in your people. It's they're alive. There's passion. And even when they're down, they're not out. And, um, and so that's one of the things that, that I'm always looking for because the two things that this job attacks, like cancer, the two psychological traits that get attacked from market participants, confidence 
and motivation. Those are the two. So I'm always saying to market participants, you have to protect confidence and motivation at all costs. Why is that? The inverse of confidence is fear. And when you start approaching the markets from a place of fear, fear distorts our ability mm -hmm. to see things accurately. Fear distorts, right? Okay, so what's the, the, the inverse relation of fear? It's confidence. How do you get confidence? One of your, one of your uh, employees said to me earlier, we were chatting in, in the room I was sitting in, and he said, he said, uh, yeah, Keith, Keith plays with a chip. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he does. <laughs> but, but, like, but so do all the greats. Why is that? Well, a chip matters because it protects you from fear, and fear distorts. So to be an accurate thinker, what we know is if this is your level of skill, your confidence should be a little higher than your skill, just a little bit, not too much because that's arrogance. But what happens is a little bit of overconfidence creates an appetite to take risk because you're, 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 you're underwriting yourself. You have conviction. You're mm -hmm. believing in yourself. So all the things that, that, that I look for, that we look for in psychology um, to get into a flow state, to function at your highest level, like there's a causal chain here to excellence. Yeah. And I see a lot of it in what, in what you guys are doing. So It's interesting. On the chip, sometimes I almost manufacture one to play against. Because I, if I create it and I know I can beat it, I'll beat it. Yeah. yeah but I got to create something that's like real, like, that's tangible. Because yeah. I'm not going to like pick some bozo on Twitter who's chirping me. That's not, that's not a chip. That's like a joke. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it, you know, it's, um, that's interesting. Like I, I think you, you got to, at least I, I, that's, that's just something anyway. But the failure component, um, I think I, I struggle less, like I don't really, like if you watch me, you know, execute the game, the waiting and the watching, the patience, just, it's in silence, it's, I'm unaffected. I don't really have, I've found some way to get that part of my amygdala to just, but I have a hard time, man, like coaching people to get there. So the hardest, that's what I was going to ask you about, which is, because I'm not like just a player. I have to be a player coach, mm -hmm. or I want to be a player coach. Yeah. It's actually much more challenging to be a coach at this point than to be a player. Yeah. You know, I know my strengths, I know my weaknesses, I know what I need to work on, including creating my own <laughs> you know, manifests of chips. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what, how, how do you think you would coach that to many? Because that's also the complexity in it, is that I'm coaching to many, mm -hmm. and they're at varying levels, mm -hmm. and certainly varying um, levels of control of their amygdala. Yeah. No, that's 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 a really good question. So. Freud made the observation that I believe to be as true as anything, anywhere, ever, right? When he said, we spend our adult lives undoing the debris of childhood. So, so the, the, the idea being that our adult lives are in some level of reaction to our childhood. Mm -hmm. I think that's generally agreed. And, and if you look at the developmental trajectory of life, and that's what developmental psychology is. It studies cradle to the grave. What does the life cycle look like? Right? And are there predictable patterns? And so one of the things that you find, and this is true on the PGA Tour as well, and it's certainly true in the markets, um, there's a really interesting facet and feature of the PGA Tour that kids who grow up in country clubs, uh, the PGA Tour is not populated by kids who grow up in country clubs. What happens is this. Kids who grow up in country clubs in affluence, Fairfield County, um, is that they're great junior golfers, and they're great high school golfers, and they become really good college golfers. But then an inflection happens that if I'm standing over a putt, and I grew up as a, as a rich kid, and, and if I miss the putt and I don't, you know, the tournament's over for me, and I'm going to stay at the Four Seasons because mom and dad, you know, booked my hotel. Whereas the other kid, and I used to, this is a golfer from Texas named Chad Campbell, played in three Ryder Cubs. Chad Campbell misses the putt, and he's sleeping in his truck, literally, with his caddy named Judd. You want to talk about a story of Texas. Chad Campbell, a Texan. Caddy named Judd, you know, grew up together playing on the Hooters tour. Um, and they miss a cut. Like, there's no hotel to sleep in. If you don't earn the money for your hotel, there's, like, who wants it more? Yeah. And so the PGA Tour is populated by people whose childhoods are largely imbued with some level of pain. Uh, Lance Armstrong, I know he's been vilified. Um, uh, but if, if, you, if you take away sort of the veneers of his life and you look at at the chip, 
Like, where was it born? That's what Freud said. It's a reaction to a really painful childhood, being cut from every team he ever tried for in Texas, in a high school that celebrated football, basketball, and baseball, and nobody cared about sports. So he couldn't, he couldn't do anything. And so everything he did, you know, from, it was just it was to prove everyone wrong. And you see that in the markets. Because again, as the markets start to attack motivation and confidence, you either have to love what you do and love the hard and celebrate the hard and actively seek it um, uh, by virtue of the fact that the, the, that's the carrot or the stick. It's like, yeah, it's Richard Gere in An Officer and a Gentleman. I got nowhere else to go. If I don't make this putt, there's no hotel room. And so it, it really, you know, getting off topic a little bit, it, it begs the question of how do we raise our children? What's the gift that you give to your kids? Historically in America, it's, I want to give my kids a better, you know, a, a, you know, a better life than I had. Well, okay, now we're in 2023. America, the wealth of America is ubiquitous for the last 50 years. And the amount of dysfunction that's imbued in the world of wealth and affluence, drug abuse, uh, anxiety, depression, the one thing that I'm committed to as a father, uh, and, 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 and this matters for people who want to live at the tail end of the curve, I am, will never protect my children from their failure. You need to feel it and live it and, 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 and learn to know what to do with it because that is the experience that will drive you through That's the hard awesome. times, right? Yeah. So your That's chip, really it's well documented because I'll read about it. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's that's a real thing. Yeah, it, it actually was a real thing for me on Sunday. I was with my son, made it to the New England um, USA Hockey Development Camp. So it's multiple states, kids. And on Sunday, he got cut. He didn't make it to the national camp thing. And um, my whole life, like, he's never been cut because I've been his coach. Yeah. But I knew he was going to get cut. He didn't know he was going to get cut, and I liked that. I liked that he thought he had the chance, right? Yeah. Um, and he was probably playing well enough that he should have believed that. And, but when he got in the car, the way he handled it was, wasn't perfect, but I let him deal with it. Yeah. And as soon as we got home, we drove back from Attle Attleboro, Mass. It was a two hour and 15 minute drive. Uh, I'm in the kitchen and I hear him ask his mom, if, 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 Hey, Mom, uh, Brady, Coach Brady's got a six, 6 o'clock tonight. Can I go to the rink? And he went to practice. <laughs> it's so good. Like I, and I just overheard him asking. Yeah. And, of course, we let him go. This is after being two-a-days since Friday in Attleboro, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, you know, it's just it's a culture, right? Your family's a culture. Your firm's a culture. Hopefully, like, there's a pretty good consistency there. If there's yeah. not, i got to wonder, like, is it real? Yeah. If, if my kids aren't coached the way I'm trying to coach Edge Eye Nation, is it, like, is it real? Mm -hmm. So back to that, I mean, you know, if the greatest thing, like you say this a lot, like you know, failure hurts more than winning or I hate losing yeah. more That's than not me saying it, that's I mean, science, yeah. science says it. But, but yeah. I mean, but, yeah. how do we deal with that? Like these, every, not one person listening to this, if they're still listening to this part of it, um, wants to lose money. No shit, right? But do you want to put in the work to reduce your failure rate on that front? Yeah. Or do you just, you know, you can see it. Like when somebody cancels from Hedge Eye, it's because they're irate because something didn't, like one of the outcomes didn't work. Yeah. You know, like I, 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 I'm going to probably struggle till, till I'm on the wrong side of the grass in terms of how to get this one right. Yeah. Co coaching it being, you know. Like, yeah. No, it's, it's, you know, we talk about how do you build one of the, one of the tragedies. I believe this to be true. The tragedies of our of our current times in our life. I was a college professor, 15 years, full professor. And you know, Abraham Maslow, the psychologist, talks about overprotecting people and, and disrespecting people by by thinking that they need your protection all the time. Mm. And to watch the current movement in safe spaces and protecting kids from words, college kids, you know, it's 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 tragic. Because in the absence of letting people experience life, what you're also preventing is the development of resilience. Yeah. And, and the development of resilience is the greatest gift. 
because life's hard. There's no way to protect people. I mean, this is from time immemorial. Suffer, suffering is the universality of the human condition. It's going to happen at some point. And if you don't have mechanisms to deal with hard times, you're going to be depressed and anxious, and your life is going to be sad. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear that your son failed and he asked to go practice, that's a tell. So if you were to have someone like you would ever call me and say, hey, can you help me with my parenting? I'd say, no, I can't improve upon that. It's like when Jordan Spieth called me, can you help me? No. <laughs> Just keep doing what you're doing. Like, like you got it. And then he went and won by 10 shots that week and, and so forth. <laughs> and so resilience matters. And, and like it's the biological mandate. You know, when boxers get punched again and again and again, you know what happens? Their bones calcify and they get stronger. When people go blind, you know what happens? Their hearing gets better. When we're hot, we sweat. When we're cold, we get goosebumps. As human beings, we are designed to adapt. And when you overprotect people from developing the mechanisms that make them resilient, you're also protecting them from having belief in themselves. So whenever I have a golfer or a market participant and things don't go well for them, what you'll often hear me say is, I'm sorry for what you're going through. I know it hurts. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't take this pain away from you even if I could. <laughs> in other words, this is your cross to bear. Um, this is formative. And what I also say is, because the brain tries to run away from pain. People escape into drugs, alcohol, and, and denial, and rationalization, blame. It's your fault. Like, no. You want to live at the tail end of the curve? Sit in your discomfort. Like, live in it. You know, Tiger Woods says, I refuse to give in to fear, real or imagined, or to be afraid of, of anyone or anything. Um, and, and, and you've heard him say a thousand times in interviews, eyeball to eyeball. He always uses the phrase eyeball to eyeball. Good. That's not just with people, it's with fear. Stare at the discomfort, live in it. Mm. Watch what emerges, uh, emerges when, when you're having the honest conversation with yourself and realize what, what Jocko Willen calls radical accountability. Yeah. And so the values you preach and, and, and the generation that you're raising, I, I, psychologically, everything you put out there, I agree with. And apparently as a father as well. And this is what I'm trying to teach my PMs That's all the cool. time. I mean, yeah. it's, um, you just mentioned uh, just listening to you or having a conversation with you, like so many triggers go off. I mean, Jocko Willink. So right now, I'm going to highlight it tomorrow, actually. I'm reading uh, his book, After Extreme Leadership, that he called The Dichotomy of Leadership. And he basically said, look, it was the wrong title. It's not extreme. The dichotomy is that there's a balance. You have to be able to be intense over here. You have to be willing to do that That's over right. here. Yeah. It's just constant, you know, to be a true leader on the front line. But it always, every single thing that he starts with is it starts with me at the top. Yeah. You know, if, if we lose a man, it's on me. If, I, if, if we have a real-time alert that's wrong, it's not on my analysts. I always say it's on me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I think that that's, that's my advice to, like, Hedge Eye Nation, is start with you, end with you. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you're not me. Do you? Yeah. I don't know how else we can really coach that. If you're trying to coach one to many, right? If you're trying to get to 250,000 people mm -hmm. understanding how to play this game at the highest level. Yeah. Why wouldn't I start with 100% responsibility, accountability, right. staring it in the face every single day? Well, you know, the brain, the, the human mandate of the brain is that it likes to think in binary terms, either or, good, bad, confident or not confident, yeah. right? So, so we, it, it, it's easy. But this is not a game that rewards simple thinking. There's nuance and there's paradox, <laughs> right, and there's complexity. And, and, and think of what the Buddha said. I think it was the Buddha. So forgive me if I misquote it, but some, some, but, the, but, but doesn't uh, undermine the quality of the idea. He says, do every act as if the fate of the universe depended on the outcome. In other words, take your work seriously. And then he says, while laughing at yourself for thinking anything you do matters at all. <laughs> like, how do you I live in it. both truths, right? As a golfer, as a quarterback yeah. in the NFL, you need psychological freedom. Otherwise, you're, you're, you're going to short arm the ball and get intercepted. Yeah. Defensive backs know if you're playing scared. And so I'm always talking about you got to be fearless. You can't be reckless, but you have to be fearless. And there's really there's really different things. Fear is the fearlessness is the absence of fear. Yeah. Why? Fear distorts. Self doubt distorts. Yeah. To try to see things as they are objectively. So yeah. And he called it by the way he called it fearless golf. That's his book, and that's, that's the first, the one, first yeah. one that I uh, that I read before I started to really get into 
to, to, to your work. Yeah. Um, we'll take, and next we'll take questions from the audience, but I just wanted to, um, you know, you, you talk kind of like a, a, a lot about this, but who I am is, and I appreciate that, those compliments. But I've Hold seen- Hold on, those aren't compliments, those are observations. There's no, there's no flattery. I'm not flattering you, I'm telling yeah. you what I see. And, I'm, I'm, and I am a fan, because you tell the truth. Well, thank you. The, um, what I was, I'm trying to bridge between how I am is how I am. How, I've seen many different players play this at the highest level that are beyond self-deprecating. That's instead of a chip, they make fun of themselves. Instead of, you know, you can see this actually on um, full swing. You can take Fitzpatrick, who's dialed in. Like, I'd, I'd be, I, I, I sound and look nothing like the guy, but I act a lot. Well, there's yeah, you see it, you see it, yeah. But you take the dude from, um, with his caddy that quite literally, to your point, lived in the car from the West Coast, and he walks around, the, he calls himself, like, I, I forget what his name is. He, he's, um, he, he did really well. Uh, at the recent U.S. Open, he was right down to the, like, the last day yeah, the top five. I, I, I'm trying to think yeah. of what his name is. But I've seen a lot of people, when I was watching that part of Full Swing, and I said this to you before we, we, we got into this, you know, the, the, what was amazing is all the different kinds of personalities. So what I want people to get comfortable with is being who they are first mm -hmm. before they commit to themselves in doing this. Yeah, yeah that's right. Because you, you don't have to be crazy me. Right. <laughs> it works for you, but not for everyone. Okay, yeah. So can you talk about that you know, in terms of like what you've sure. seen and the, the, like the, how wide of spectrum personalities can be to, to accept being fearless? Yeah, no, that's, that's a, that's a, when I say it's a beautiful question, the question is what it is, but the expression of that question is there's a thing of beauty. So going back to sort of the, the Socratic dictum, you know, when I guess when, when, when Socrates went uh, to the... The oracle at Delphi, right? And, and, and you, Socrates, you're the wisest man in all of Athens. Well, why is that? Because you alone know yourself. You alone know what you do not know, right? And, and the translation is, well, not Nadi Sutran, I think. Nadi Sutran. Know thyself. And what, what you see, the mistakes that people make uh, all the time, is, is they try to be something they're not. Mm -hmm. And it's inauthentic. And so this idea of Nadi Sutra, know thyself. And, and the, the thing about market participants and our PGA Tour golfers is, like, you're not going to outwork, you weren't going to outwork Ben Hogan or Gary Player uh, or Tiger Woods. Um, like, Jack Nicklaus didn't work very hard, but Jack knew that his advantage was his mind. Mm. And so Jack would work to the point where, so, so what you see on the PGA Tour, we talk about skill development. There's two buckets. Some people practice skill till they get it right. And other people practice a skill until they can't get it wrong. That's two different universes, right? And so this works for you because you know yourself. Now, what's hard for people? This is one of the most, this is probably the biggest idea to come out of psychology in the last hundred years. The biggest, and I mean that literally. Your brain is not designed for you to be an accurate observer of yourself. You don't see yourself accurately. Keith. You do not know Keith. Neither is my brother. I don't know Geo. And, and no one who participates in the markets has an accurate view of themselves mm. because the mechanisms in the brain make sure we have biases. We don't see ourselves accurate, which is why we, you're married, so you get this. Your wife comes to you and says, hey, you know what? You're sloppy. You're, you, you know, you, there are, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not sloppy. Or, you know what? You're critical. No, I'm not critical. But when your spouse is giving you feedback, we all get defensive. Your boss is saying, hey, you're not. We immediately, why? Because criticism hurts. The brain immediately revolts against it. But when you juxtapose that against the reality that no one is an accurate observer of themselves. So, so the first thing we have to start with, if we want to be really, really good at anything, is you have to humble yourself and say, you know what? I don't see myself accurately. So I'm going to trust a handful of people. And when, I said it this morning to my coach. What are you seeing out of me? You know, what, what do you see? It's a humble thing because you're inviting criticism and feedback. Mm -hmm. I know real money makers who leave the office at 5 o'clock because what they know is if they stay till 8, they're going to ignore their family. And if they ignore their family, they're going to be miserable. If they're miserable, they're not going to make money. Mm -hmm. And they make it up in other ways. Mm -hmm. You have to do you, but you have to compensate for your weaknesses. Right? So, so it's, it's a, there's five ways to win in this game. Talent. 
work ethic, process, differentiated thinking, thinking, hiring for, to compensate for your, for your week. That's it. Talent. You're either more talented than anybody else. Process. You have a great process that you're going to commit to to compensate for your lack of talent. Work ethic. I'm not that smart. Um, 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 you know, I'm reasonably talented, but I'm willing to only sleep six hours to, to compensate. Okay, I don't have any of that, so I'm going to hire people to compensate. For like the, but that's it. It's a closed system. <laughs> but you better know what you are, right? Yeah, yeah. And for you, it's, it's a combination of things. Um, what you see out of the special, special, special people, Michael Jordan, not only the most talented, but also the hardest worker. Steve Cohen, super talented. I, I, I met with Steve Cohen's uh, high school friends having dinner. And when he went to the bathroom, they said to me, he's the same as he was in high school. He was doing this when he was 17. It's the same. We always knew. So when you combine talent with desire and you repeat that, like, good luck, right? So it's... I love it. Yeah. What a great... What a great way to articulate a question a lot of people have. Um, this first question, I'm just going to read it. This is uh, it's good. Uh, Paul Clayton, he actually gets his second question of the day with two different, uh, two different guests. Hi, Dr. Gio. Great to have a performance coach and a psychologist on the show. Uh, when dealing with acute chronic stress, the roller coaster of winning and losing the market, what are the best strategies that high performers that you've worked with use to deal with this? So, acute chronic stress. Yeah, acute and chronic are they, they're different. Acute stress is when stress spikes yep. and comes down. Chronic stress is the everydayness yep. of it, right? Yep. So, so let's, let's parse that out. Stress and the research on stress is unequivocal. Um, I, I'll give you, I'll tell you, I'll interpret. How much time do we have? Because I want to make sure that I'm being uh, respectful. 15 minutes. Okay. Yep. So let's talk about stress. Stress is statistically significantly correlated with everything bad, <laughs> like cancer heart disease, early death, like stress is bad. So stress management uh, is, is a huge feature of success. Now, what we know about the tail end of the curve is successful people invite stress, like they welcome it. But what we also know about stress, it's how you interpret it will determine what it does to your physiology. So for example, same with failure. If I show you a video, and this is out of research out of Stanford University, if I show you a video that talks about all the, all the bad effects of stress, um, all, the, all the bad things it does to you. And then you go for the next month in a stressful job. Your body will manifest all those bad things. If I show you a video that, that talks about all the good things about stress, it sharpens focus, it increases productivity, it increases accuracy. Um, when you're not stressed, you sleep better, right? Your body will manifest those things. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. You know, I know there's a lot of bad psychology out there. But good psychology really matters. And, and, and the most fundamental feature of good psychology, and William James talked about this, and I love William James. <coughs> Marcus Aurelius, the, you know, the, the mind is its own place and can make a hell of heaven or a heaven of hell. Stress, partially, not fully, but partially, what stress will do to you is partially determined by how you interpret it. Mm -hmm. Kobe put a lot of stress on himself, Kobe Bryant, but he always interpreted it as the more I put on myself, the better I get. Mm. And as a function of that, it worked for him. So that's bullet point one. Bullet point <coughs> two is, and this is the conversation I had with a PM this morning, he's having a great year, um, but he's, he's tapped out psychologically. And, and what happens about every June on the PGA Tour, and I would know when I traveled the PGA Tour for 15 years, when Freud said the eyes are the window to the soul, uh, what you see on the PGA Tour every year is people start walking around with what I call dead eyes. You mm -hmm. can just see this yep. lifelessness. And that's a problem because you can't play the game against those killers um, if you're not switched on, right? And so one of the things you have to do if you're at a point of acute and or chronic stress is you have to disengage. And, and Leonardo da Vinci has a really beautiful quote about this, right? Da Vinci maybe the greatest mind of all time. He said, every once in a while, go away from your work. Because what that does is, is you go from subject to object. In other words, instead of being the goldfish in the fishbowl, you're, you're outside observing yourself in the fishbowl. And so, like, take your book down. I have a PM that I worked with, unbelievably good PM. I, I, I won't say his name, but um, when I first got him, <laughs> he, was, he was green. But I, I had said to 
the founder of the firm at the time, I said, hey, this guy is going to be a franchise. Like, you can build a business around this guy. Okay? I knew what I'm looking at. Lo and behold, here we are 10 years later, and this guy's a franchise. But what happened with this guy is seven months into you know, his first job as a portfolio manager uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the buy side, he was in a draw. So he did what all people with a puritanical work ethic do. He worked harder because that's what you people do. Like the answer to everything in your life is work harder, right? I get that. But if you take a 1,000 people who, for whom that's been the answer to their whole lives, you put them in a distribution, right? So, so everyone's a work all. Where's the advantage then? The advantage is to the person who knows how to throttle back because, because when you get exhausted and you're not switched on, you start making mistakes. So yeah. I told this guy, I said, hey, you need to come see me in Florida. He goes, I can't. I go, why can't you? Because I need to work. I go, why do you need to work? Because <laughs> I'm losing money. Like, but how's, <laughs> how's that working for you? Right? And so what I'm trying to tell you is you say that you don't have the time to take a break. How's, how's this working for you? You have acute and, and chronic stress. You're probably losing money, and you can't, afford, you can't afford not to take a break. Reset, because good ideas never come out of a, text, uh, a toxic mindset. I'll say it again. Good ideas never come out of a toxic mindset. If it doesn't get you now, it'll get you eventually. You need to shut it down and get out of Dodge. Yeah. I, 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 when people say, like, why do you, why do you coach? Like, how do you coach and spend time at the golf course with your, you can play around with your kids? Like, why do you, that forces you. Yeah. I mean, I do it because I love it. But it also is quite enjoyable because it checks you out of being, like I call it being bolted to the seat. I mean, you non-dead eyes. Like, yeah. <laughs> you want to do this without being like in the game? I mean, no. I mean, I don't want to play that way. It's not going to be. That's not going to be the way I play. Um, all right. Here's an interesting question um, from Dave Sebastian. Excellent interview, Dr. Geo. Uh, do you find that the best at their trade are all are always able to bounce back at any age? And are they able to get better as they get older? Awesome question. So, so old sort of archaic research suggests that there's a diminishment in cognitive functioning past the age of, call it, 50. Um, modern science shows that that's not necessarily true. There's, there's a, uh, there's, there's, there's a, there's, he's not really a young man, he's, he's, he's a, a market participant, he's new to me, a guy named Sam Wisney, I don't know, and, and, uh, I mean, his name comes to mind, who sort of blew me away a little bit. One of the things, the reason I came to the markets from golf, love, athletes are geniuses in their own way, but, but I get smarter when, when working with people who are smarter than me, and, and the markets are full of really fucking smart people, <laughs> excuse my language. The IQ points and the horsepower. Yeah in the markets. And, 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 and I use this person as an example, and maybe we could delete his name out if he doesn't want me to use it. I think he's 50. And he's 50 and getting better. And now why is that? Well, we know about the malleability of the brain, neuroplasticity, and all the inputs now that can lead to you elevating instead of diminishing well into your 70s. So no longer is it a case that you're 50 and diminishing, or 55. I mean, if you do nothing, yes, you'll diminish. Like, like, like everything being equal, there, there's a fall-off point. But if you're willing to challenge, and that's it's just biology, and, and, and continually challenge your brain, um, put yourself in hard situations, and what you realize is past the age of 50, you get the blending of, of judgment uh, and accuracy of thinking. So um, what I would say to you is don't drink. Work out really, really hard every day that you can. Do something uncomfortable all the time, and don't buy into the narrative that you have to diminish with age. That's interesting. I mean, because that's really where, I mean, golf, with all of its similarities to this game, or any professional sport, there are diminishing returns with age. You're not going to be at your best at 54 years old as, uh, as a hockey player. You, know, you could try, right. but it's not going to happen. Um, Phil, Mickelson, Phil Mickelson won, an age at, uh, won a major at 50. Yeah, 50. But I mean, let's just say, change the number to 60. Whereas in this game, 60, 70, 80, right. there's no like... There's no physical limitation. No, yeah, exactly. It's, it's like, cognitive, yeah. 
And to train your brain takes a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Like I mean, it's it's ongoing. Yeah. To train your emotions, which is the bigger part of it, I think. I yeah. Mean, it's um, it's amazing. Uh, I think you know, time for I'll just take the last question. But the when you get in a market like this, when you're dealing with all these, when when he says PMs, he means portfolio managers. Um, you're dealing with all sorts of types, all sorts of scores. Like like you said, the um, the achievement domains, the score, scoreboard. Yeah. Everyone in the game, including anyone who's investing right now, has a score. Mm -hmm. How how much do times like this, you'd have to really go back to 2001, where you get this start to the year, where you're either on the right side of it or you're not. Yeah. How much does that affect, or have you seen that affect and change people's process, deviate from process, you know, if at all? Yeah, uh, qu quite a bit, right? And, and, and here's the thing you have to understand. If you're gonna be a lifelong market participant, you, I'm being very literal here. You will have experienced everything the job has to offer. <laughs> yes, like, you like will. all of it. There's no way around it. There are years where you'll where you'll start hot, lose your money, gain it back at the end of the year. There's years where you start down, make it like. There's years where your process is great and you don't get paid for it. There's years where where your process is great and you get overpaid. There's years where your life is too complicated and your wife or your kids are going through something, so you're not really all in, and sort of you somehow made a lot of money. But like, you will experience everything the job. There's no way around it. And so one of the things <laughs> I would always tell golfers is, the reason we practice isn't to avoid hard times. It's to give us the tools to go through the hard times because the precision required on the PGA Tour is so precise. Well, it's the same with this, right? And so, and so you don't know what the year is going to deliver to you. No one knows. Forecasting is such an imperfect science. What I'm saying is whatever gets thrown your way, have a playbook to adapt. So, for example, if the market's trying to give you money, open up the duffel bag and fill it up. If, the, if it's a hard market and recurringly hard, well, then dig into your resilience, your discipline, your process, be okay having a flat year. If, like I said about Tiger Woods, the process is perfect and there's no money to be made. That's not up to you. When you start imposing your needs on the market, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. The market's bigger than you, right? Which is why I love your waiting and listening and watching. You always have to be present to pivot. So a year like this, it's hard for a lot of people, but like define hard. We're not in a gulag, right? We're not living in a gulag. <laughs> Um, just be smart with your money. Don't don't spend beyond your means. Love the hard times, um, and and understand that you know that, that, that life and, and and making money is not up and to the right. Like as much as every risk manager wants it to be, you know sometimes it comes in buckets. Maybe it'll come in three times a year. You'll make a bunch of money, and the rest of it's flat. Sometimes it's you'll make money a hundred trading days. But like humble yourself. Realize that you're a market participant. Like you didn't invent the world. You have to live in it like everybody else. And, and what, the, what the adaptive, malleable mind does is, is leverage, psychological leveraging, which is, okay, what tools do I have to work with? How do I leverage what I have to work with um, and, uh, and play my best game? And then you know, when it's over, like shut it down, hug your wife and kids, enjoy your time, and then wake up the next day and re-engage, right? What else is there? I love that. It's a great way to end. Good. Uh, I didn't want it to end, but at some point the game's got to end. Yeah. And uh, we're gonna, the clock ran out. Yeah, the yeah, clock. I'm looking at the clock over there. But um, thank you. It's a different, a, an entirely different perspective than what people are used to on the investing is side. Is it really? Yeah. We don't have. I mean, we don't have psychologists and people who coach at the highest level. On, on the investing summit. Yeah. And I think that it's such, it's always been a critical part of the game, the behavioral component of the game, yeah. the mental part of the game. But it's increasingly in these times, which is why we wanted to make the time to, yeah. to, to highlight, like don't forget that, it's core. Yeah. It's core to, to, to anything that you want to achieve. So um, thanks. Good. I appreciate thanks, Keith. It. I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Good. He is Dr. Gio. That was my third of three. 
I'll be on the back nine tomorrow with uh, day three, which is the, the last day of the investing summit. So thank you for joining us.